Good evening. I'm Marty Martin, president of Drake University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 36th annual Stahlnacher Lecture at Drake University. Of course, normally I'd be greeting you from the stage of Sheslow Auditorium, but as with all things these days, and certainly this includes all things at Drake University, we've had to adapt due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And adapt we have. We have, as in so many other things, we're now using technology to deliver this annual lecture to all of you. It says with so many things that we have done here, we find a way to continue the life of this institution. And in this instance, a celebration of the intellectual life of this institution, and particularly the intellectual life of our College of Arts and Sciences. But we find a way to do it and a way to press on. So again, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us this evening. You know, a fixture at the Stonlocker Lecture from its beginning, and I would imagine every single year thereafter, was Professor Emeritus of Religion and former Dean of our School of Divinity, John McCall, who was a graduate of Drake from Knight Liberal Arts degree in 1939, went on to get additional degrees from Butler University and the University of Chicago before returning to Drake in 1950 become the Dean of our Divinity School, and he remained at Drake as our Dean and a Professor of Religion and Philosophy it, up until he retired in 1982. But even thereafter, John was a constant presence on this campus to include, as I said a moment ago, always being in attendance at the Stalnock Lecture, and I think indeed in the past, he served as a Master of Ceremonies. Sadly, John passed away on June the 29th at the age of 103, and so he cannot join us tonight in person, but he is still here in spirit because one of the things that John cherished the most about being at a university is the intellectual engagement that it offered him and that he offered to others. And again, that is what we're doing tonight. We are celebrating the intellectual life of the institution as brought to us by select members of our College of Arts and Sciences. So although again, John cannot be with us in person, he is certainly with us in spirit, he would, as we all do, uh, welcome the opportunity to hear remarks from one of our faculty that will enrich and enlighten us. If you would, please just join me for one moment of silence in remembering John McCall. Thank you. And again, welcome to the 36th Annual Stahnacher Lecture. I know you're going to enjoy this. Thank you, President Martin, for your remarks. I am Jennifer McCrickard, Professor of Philosophy and Religion here at Drake. Good evening. Welcome to the 36th Annual Luther W. Stallnacher Lecture. As you know, Drake University is committed to its public role as the place where the community comes together to address issues of vital importance. The Stallnacher Lecture is one of our most powerful resources in fulfilling that commitment. It is one of the most important annual events in the intellectual life of the university. The Stallmacher Lecture was conceived during academic year 1984-1985 by then Dean Mike Marty. Wanting to create a meaningful lecture experience, Dean Marty turned to the faculty emeriti with a proposal. He requested that they consider making special gifts to underwrite a lectureship that would become an important intellectual event on the campus. With the leadership of Dean Emeritus Ellsworth Woods, a number of the emeriti responded favorably and have offered continued support for the lecture throughout the years. We would like to recognize and thank the faculty emeriti who have joined us this evening. We also want to recognize those who have delivered the presentations that have turned the Stahlnacher Lecture into one of the premier intellectual events on campus. Let's give them a round of virtual applause. Those who conceived and brought this lecture to reality chose to name it in honor of a distinguished forebear, many whom many of them knew well. Luther W. Stahlnacher received his AB degree from Drake University in 1920. He returned to Drake in 1927 to teach philosophy, became Dean of the College of Liberal Arts in 1941, and served in that position until his untimely death in 1954. 
Professor John McCaw, who President Martin just honored in his introductory remarks, served as the evening's Masters of, Master of Ceremonies for many years. After his retirement, he attended the Stallnacher Lecture every year. Professor McCaw described Dr. Stallnacher as a humanist who was thoroughly grounded in classical languages and who blended the classical traditions with those of science and of the Enlightenment. He would no doubt have been honored by the lectureship that has been carried forth in his name. Members of the Stallnacher family continue to remain connected to the university, and we thank them for their supportive engagement. After tonight's lecture, there will be a brief question and answer session. You can post your questions in the chat function at any time. Again, thank you for being here for this milestone event in Drake's intellectual history. It is custom that the previous year's lecturer introduces the speaker of the evening. It is therefore now my honor to introduce my colleague, Tim Nepper, professor of philosophy, who will introduce tonight's speaker. And it is now my honor to introduce the 2020 Stolnicker lecturer, Sandra Patanamani. Sandy, if I may, is a professor of American studies in the Department for the Study of Culture and Society, where she teaches classes in anthropology, sociology, and women's studies. Sandy arrived at Drake in 2001, not long after both earning her PhD from the University of Maryland in American Studies and publishing her first book with New York University Press, Birthmarks, an interdisciplinary ethnographic study of transracial adoption. Sandy's lecture tonight will draw from her second book to be published with NYU Press, Queering Family Trees, Race, Reproductive Justice, and Lesbian Motherhood, which was released early this year. Bookended by these two monographs, are not only numerous journal articles, book chapters, and conference presentations, but also video essays, oral histories, and other digital humanities projects. And Sandy is currently working on yet another monograph and another documentary. These accomplishments have not gone unnoticed at Drake. Just last year, Sandy was awarded both the Troyer Research Fellowship and the Slay Fellowship for Community Engagement. And there is also, of course, Sandy Stonecker, which is why we are all here tonight. So let's get on with it already. Please join me in welcoming the 2020 Stonecker lecturer, Dr. Sandra Patanamani, who will now speak to us about the topic of her second book, Queering Family Trees, Race, Reproductive Justice, and Lesbian Motherhood. Sandy. I'm muted. sorry. Now I'm here. <laughs> All right. I am honored again <laughs> to be with you tonight to talk about my new book, Queering Family Trees. Thank you so much for joining me. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Humanities Center, the Provost's Office, the College of Arts and Sciences at Drake University, as well as Humanities Iowa and the Williams Institute at the UCLA Law School for generously funding this research. I'm grateful to my colleagues and family for supporting me on this research journey. One of the most challenging aspects of putting together a talk like this is trying to decide which aspects of work to, uh, to emphasize. This book explores a 25 year time frame from 1990 when same sex marriage emerged as a significant social issue in the US to 2015 when same sex marriage was legalized at the federal level. So I'll begin with a few comments about the research and my findings. This interdisciplinary ethnographic work draws on over 100 interviews with African American, indigenous, Latina, Asian American and white queer mothers living in a range of US states considered in relation to news media and public law and policy debates. Both academic work and mainstreamed public debates about same-sex marriage and adoption have primarily focused on sexual orientation. 
largely ignoring the ways that race, gender, and class shape the lived experience of queer parents and their children. The lives of these mothers demonstrate that intersections of racial ethnic identity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexuality, tribal affiliation, and geography profoundly shape access to family protections, rights, and privileges. What kinds of, rec of relationships are recognized supported and legitimated shapes who is able to construct families and how. Compulsory heterosexuality positions lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, trans people outside the legitimate channels of family making. Yet queer people don't experience this outsiderness in the same ways. Gender profoundly shapes how people become parents and whether and how their family relationships are recognized. Race and class intersect in complex ways to shape parenting. The stakes in these family policy debates concern how inequality is reproduced in stealthy ways that deny inequality and blame individuals for social problems. This research contributes then to both mainstream and scholarly understandings of queer families and their relations to law and policy, but it's also an important reminder that all families are shaped by law and policy. Queering Family Trees explores the voices and stories of queer mothers as lenses through which to understand and to redefine the ways we understand family. A big topic, and that brings me back to the question of focus. So this evening I'll be drawing primarily on the theoretical chapter of my book in which I dig into questions about how to understand competing social meanings about race, gender, kinship, class, and whose stories get recorded and heard. I critically explore the ways racialized narratives about motherhood have shaped this pressing social issue. And I'll begin with a, a very brief video clip uh, that, uh, excuse me, a brief video clip that begins, that draws on one of the videos that I've created about this family tree project. Uh, there we go. The genealogy website I joined didn't let me list my wife unless I listed myself as husband or put one of us in the father category for our children. No space for adoptees here either. I spent ages trying to figure out a way to represent having more than one set of parents. I try adding my half biological siblings, sneaking my birth parents in through the back door. We are not legible here. The site provides detailed instructions on how to label a child as non-biological, when this is expected and when it is required. Legitimacy is codified through biology. Outsiders are marked. Social narratives about family trees, heritability, likeness, and difference reinforce notions of family as natural and thus unchanging. This seems on some levels like common sense, but when we dig deeper, we begin to see contradictions. I read the family tree as an allegory about kinship, reproduction, and belonging. It's a story reaffirming that traditional families are connected biologically through heterosexual reproduction. Yet what of power and law? These tensions are often framed as reproductive, these tensions are often framed as nature versus nurture. Yet this ignores the role of social power in defining family legitimacy. My research demonstrates that this framework represents what society defines as legitimate families. I was struck by how rigid the genealogy websites were as I tried to both research our family's past and document our present. Fictions of race, gender, class, sexuality, and family are embedded in their very operating systems. Genealogy is literally a computer application program that provides a template for what counts as family. Participating requires negotiation with mainstream definitions of family legitimacy encoded in the application as biological and therefore natural. And this concept is reproduced every time a user enters a profile or views a family tree. 
Family genealogy records the official story, legitimate marriages and births, and defines who gets left out or stigmatized. These rules are not random. They're deeply embedded in public law and policy. Lineage is traced through legal matrimony in the patriarchal system. Children's status as legitimate citizens is determined through their mother's marriage to a man. Historically legitimate lines of inheritance determine property transfer, class status, and social recognition, creating legal links between families and society. But what about the people who fall between these social definitions of illegitimate and real families? Legitimacy is the axis upon which both social and legal recognition of family turns, and this has profound consequences for families and persons deemed illegitimate. If my family's illegible in the online templates for kinship in the present, I have to wonder who was left out in the past. The legitimate family tree depends on erasure and absence of difference. So what would a genealogy of illegitimacy look like? Not only would previously unrecognized kin become visible, but so too would the relations of power shaping and regulating these exclusions. In this critical genealogy, I fill in blanks, absences, and erasures of family perpetrated by power inequalities. I draw on a range of disciplines, including cultural anthropology, critical race theory, queer theory and queer of color critique, women's and gender studies, sociology, and American studies. I explore allegories as links between individuals, families, media, and public policy and law. Points of contact, measures of negotiation over social and political meaning. I engage an intersectional perspective that embraces tensions at the center of this issue. This approach helps us to see how power relations shape families and how we navigate inequality. I would like to suggest that an allegorical approach to conflicting social narratives might help us rethink how we make sense of contentious social debates about motherhood, family, and nation. This approach makes visible the ways that white supremacy, patriarchy, compulsory heterosexuality, and economic inequality are reproduced and reinscribed in social debates about family, equality, and nation. I'll share with you this evening three allegories about queer family making. The first is at the level of lived experience. The next is about news and policy. And the final story I return to family trees, considering questions of kinship, nature, and history. Oops. The first section is called Ethnographic Allegories, Legitimacy and the Presumption of Parentage. It focuses on the lived experiences of a queer black mother living in Iowa. I begin with a quote from an interview with her that I conducted in 2008 prior to the legalization of same-sex marriage in Iowa in 2009. It's the duty of the state to protect everyone equally. And now even folks with money are not fully protected. Basic equality is not being afforded to people all over our country. Ray's an African-American mother of two biracial children whom she co-parents with her ex-husband, the father of her daughter, Hannah, and her ex-girlfriend, the other mother of her son, Jackson. At the time of our interview in 2008, the legal landscape of family law and policy in the U.S. regarding same-sex marriage and adoption was uneven and swiftly changing. She was a part-time student pursuing a master's degree in women's studies and also working part-time in the nonprofit sector, parenting full-time and practicing and performing with her band on a regular basis. I explored divisive political debates about same-sex families from Ray's perspective as a queer mother of color who's defined as the state by the state as illegitimate. Ray is located in a socially, in a particularly vulnerable position in regards to parental rights. She and her ex-partner Jasmine, a white woman, conceived their son with the sperm of Jasmine's brother who had no interest in being a legal or relational father. 
In the state of Iowa in 2003, when Jackson was born, chil uh, <coughs> excuse me, children born to unwed mothers were not allowed to enter the name of the father on the paperwork for birth certificates at the time of birth. Unmarried parents were required to file a separate set of forms declaring paternity in order to have the father's name listed on the birth certificate, at which time an amended document would be issued. There were no options for a second mother to be added without a second parent adoption. Thus, Ray is listed as Jackson's only parent on his birth certificate. The contrast between Ray's two children's relationships to the state is instructive making clear that parental rights and responsibilities are determined by marriage, not biology. Her oldest daughter, Hannah, was born while Ray was married to a man, and thus her birth certificate establishes her legitimacy by listing both her parents. If Ray had used a sperm donor when she was legally married to a man, her husband would be automatically listed as father on the birth certificate anyway. Legal marriage determines parental rights for fathers in the U.S. under the doctrine of the presumption of parentage. Same-sex marriage wasn't legal in Iowa in 2003 when their son was born, and thus in the eyes of the law, he was born illegitimate to an unwed mother, though his two mothers were together at the time of his birth. Ray and Jasmine's son has two parents, yet Jasmine was unable to legally recognize her relationship with him without going through the invasive and expensive process of second parent adoption. In Iowa, second parent adoptions were legal, but so expensive they were financially out of reach for Ray and many of the other people that we interviewed. They couldn't afford this option. So Ray is his only legal parent, though his two mothers share custody. Indeed, many of the families we interviewed could not afford second parent adoptions or other legal measures available through lawyers at a cost. And so their families, <clears throat> excuse me, were labeled or were rendered illegitimate and vulnerable. Ray and Jasmine had the choice to protect their family relationships through second parent adoption. They couldn't afford it, so ultimately it really was not a viable option. As a queer woman of color, Ray is located outside the family protections offered heterosexual married parents. The intersection of her sexual orientation with her identity as a single African-American mother limits Ray's access to family protection. As a single black mother, she's more likely to experience discrimination in the labor market, which circumscribes her ability to legally protect her children. Her family making experiences make visible the ways that sexual orientation intersects with race, gender, and class through laws that limit access to tangible family protections for non-married parents and their children. Her family is defined as illegitimate because she's not married. She cannot legally marry the mother of her child because they're not heterosexual. They cannot legitimize their son through second parent adoption because they cannot financially afford the legal fees. No one should have to buy protections that are accorded by law to other citizens. This unequal distribution of rights and protections for children and parents is normalized and obscured by public policy narratives, emphasizing the legitimate structure of natural and traditional families. We can read her life or anyone's as allegorical through the ways social narratives inform her view of the world, as well as how her life story speaks beyond itself to articulate the contours of social power relations and the ways they organize and regulate family, legitimacy, and citizenship. There are connections between the stories she tells and those she receives from various sources. Her life stories are informed by the way she is narrated in social interactions. She must engage with media representations that shape social understandings of single black mothers and with governmental definitions of motherhood and family. Her engagement with and resistance to social narratives defining queer mothers of color speak to the ways that families positioned as illegitimate or queer make meaning and navigate social worlds not designed to support them. I read her life story as allegorical rather than representative. Ethnographic analysis does not rely on whether the research sample is representative or not. That language belongs to other academic frameworks. Rather, the emphasis here is deeply 
contextual. We learn about the intimate workings of power in everyday lives through the stories of mothers socially defined outside normal or traditional families. I want to shift gears now to the sociopolitical context in which Ray and other queer moms navigate family. The most pervasive stories in public dialogues about families headed by lesbians and gay mothers, excuse me, gay men at the turn of the 21st century, suggest that legalizing same-sex marriage should be either the panacea for all the constitutional vulnerabilities of queer citizenship or the downfall of civilization due to the crumbling of the institution of marriage. The introduction of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act in 1996, DOMA, as I'll refer to it from here on, ushered same-sex marriage along with welfare and immigration reform, I put that in quotes, some people call it deform, into a particularly vicious political dialogue about family values. The floor of Congress hosted unprecedented debates focused on deviant mothers and their children as a threat to the nation. Having two mothers and no father was represented as a threat to family values, as was being a single mother receiving AFDC or an immigrant mother without government documentation. Illegitimate mothers were represented as the villains in a sociopolitical narrative about family, race, reproduction, and citizenship in political debates, news media, and social interactions. These debates continued through a series of court cases legislative proposals and laws regulating same-sex marriage in the U.S. that culminated in the 2015 Supreme Court ruling in Oberfell v. Hodges overturning DOMA as unconstitutional. Yet queer mothers were not the only mothers targeted as illegitimate. The debate over DOMA was part of a larger policy agenda concerned with the politics of reproduction and family. On a practical policy level, the laws passed in the 1990s overhauled the social welfare system and deepened inequality along lines of race, class, sexuality, and gender in ways that public narratives were largely successful at masking. Not only was the social safety net for vulnerable families dismantled, but the media and policy discussions about the mothers most deeply affected by these changes denied the existence of inequality and blamed governmental oppression on women's own supposedly bad choices. The stories deployed in news media and on the floor of Congress to justify government yet in different ways. Narrative is crucial to this kind of policing. In the 1990s, public discourse was saturated with rhetoric citing family breakdown as the cause of contemporary social problems. The details of said breakdown were different depending on the population under consideration, but converged around the supposedly irresponsible child bearing and rearing by mothers outside the ideal. The intersection between welfare reform and same-sex marriage turns on the definition of legitimate mother and child through legal attachment to a man, defined socially, morally, and economically. Public discourse in this era developed into two distinct streams of debate concerning marriage. Lesbian mothers were prohibited from marrying because not having a father was supposedly not in the best interests of children. Single mothers were urged to marry as a means of escaping poverty and supposedly ensuring the proper socialization of their children. Single low-income mothers and queer mothers are positioned in different yet revealing ways in relation to the social promotion of legitimate family. Yet these are not mutually exclusive categories. The rhetoric is framed as if all single mothers receiving social benef welfare benefits are straight. Lesbian mothers of color are vulnerable to the same forces of economic inequality as heterosexual mothers of color, and likely more. The intersecting, po intersecting political story about both single mothers and queer mothers was that without the presence of a father, children cannot be properly socialized into productive citizens. 
The terms of these two streams of public debate about mothers and marriage have been explicitly linked through the widely appealing fable that the supposed breakdown in the family fails American society through a failure of socialization of future productive citizens. Racial narratives were woven into these political tales at the most basic level. Euphemisms like illegitimate, dependent, and illegal were employed to discuss people of color while simultaneously denying the social relevance of race. Policy proposals focused on regulating the reproductive capacities of women deemed unfit as mothers because they're not in legally sanctioned marital relationships with productive citizens, legally employed men. These discussions about unfit mothers drew on a deep history of racist political representations of women of color as inadequate mothers. And while it's very important to dispute racist media images, even more important is that we think critically about how they function in politics. In this debate, legitimacy was figured as white, straight, and middle class. Mothers of color came to signal illegitimacy and bad motherhood without explicitly naming race. While aiming to rid the larger public of the social problems supposedly resulting from illegitimacy and illegality, legislation targeted the reproductive behavior of women outside the bounds of legal marriage and citizenship. The Defense of Marriage Act prohibited same-sex marriage. Aid to families with dependent children was dismantled. Changes in immigration laws increased border patrols, surveillance, penalties for undocumented immigrants caught inside U.S. borders, and deepened restrictions on employment, benefits, and assistance for legal immigrants. Sociopolitical allegories justify these punitive policies. Allegories are about relationships between small stories and big stories, personal narratives, social fables, historical tales, legal fictions. Family narratives don't simply mirror public representation of families, nor is the reverse true in any straightforward sense. Families function in negotiation with social narratives about kinship and citizenship, as well as through concrete interactions with the laws and policies shaping their access to social resources and protections. These public stories shape how people live their lives and how we learn to see ourselves and others. Ray tells a story about interacting with the social welfare system that demonstrates how she, excuse me, <coughs> that demonstrates how we learn to see ourselves in others. She was pregnant with her second child and she had just gotten a new job and there was a waiting period before she could activate her health insurance. So she signed up she applied for Medicaid in order to maintain prenatal care throughout her entire pregnancy, which of course is a claim on her standing as a U.S. citizen. I'll play now a clip of her telling the story. So yeah, I had to wait 60 or 90 days. Uh, and so in the short term, I had to get like Medicaid or Title 19, whatever it was, just to supplement till I got uh, my insurance uh, kicked in. So here I am about to give birth and I have to go and sign up for, you know, um, for state aid uh, medical. And uh, the guy, bless his heart, was as cool as he could possibly be. But uh, again, I wasn't gonna lie. I'm like, I, I know who the biological sperm donor is, but this baby doesn't have a father. I get to fill out all the paperwork. I'm like, he's got another mom. And I don't really know how to do your paperwork. And I'm not being difficult. I'm just being honest. I'm not going to lie. I'm also not going to name someone who is, I don't want to be a dad. You know, I'm just giving you this stuff because I know it'll work, you know. And I'm, so the guy says to me, he's like, you know what? That's cool. He's like, okay, but if if you're in whatever your benefits or whatever, if you're ever audited or, or whatever it is that they do to see if you really should be getting benefits, you're going to have to come up with something. He says, and the best thing I can tell you is for you to say that you were really wasted one night and you had sex with multiple men and you don't even remember who they are and you got pregnant. And so when he said that, I, I did, I was kind of like, really? 
This governmental employee narrates her identity as a mother and a citizen in relation to the state through hackneyed narratives about economically irresponsible black women having one night stands with multiple men. Politics is bartered in stories. The Medicaid man needs a story that fits into the state's box. Politicians need a tale that justifies destroying the social safety net for mothers and children in poverty. Ray tried to tell her story, but it didn't fit the narrative structure the state has continually written for women of color who are not legally attached to men. There was no space for the recognition of a black lesbian mother. Sperm donor was not part of the lexicon of the social welfare system. There was no room for multiple family forms. Mothers were only legible to the state in relation to fathers. This story is activated and enforced through welfare policies passed in the 1990s that require paternity information on applications for public assistance. Power is the absent character in this fable. How does this erasure of power function as a story blaming individual mothers for larger social problems? How is this narrative effective in justifying punitive social policies? How is the story reproduced over and over again in different sites in various voices through all sorts of media. These are very old stories and they're entrenched in and through social policy, media, and history. Ray's story shows us how race narrates social relations while denying its very existence. The Medicaid man didn't have to mention race because it was already embedded in socio-political allegories about black women's irresponsible sexual decisions. Public narratives about women of color as sexually licentious have been a remarkably consistent storyline in the justification of oppression. I turn now to my final allegory. Conservative politicians at the turn of the 21st century Spun tales linking gender, race, sexual deviance, poverty, and illegitimacy is the new threat to the American family and thus society. Arguments emphasize traditional marriage and family as natural, normal, and unchanging over time. Mothers and children outside the patriarchal heteronormative ideal. Lesbians, women of color, immigrants, women experiencing poverty were cast as a new threat to traditional family morality. Yet turning a critical eye on constructions of history makes clear that marriage and legitimacy have always regulated family and citizenship through exclusion. The story, families have always been this way, is dependent on the erasure of anyone outside the boundaries of family legitimacy. My own family history illustrates the narrative reproduction of whiteness. The process of racializing as white by family genealogy depends first on the omission of slavery in our oral family history, and second on the legal and social fictions of genealogical legitimacy that erase enslaved ancestors from the genealogical record. Laws regulating marriage, adoption, inheritance, anti-miscegenation, labor, and property transfer support social views of legitimate family relationships as natural, traditional, and unchanging. These pervasive narratives of whiteness as the norm must also be critically explored. My family, it seems, has been passing as white for generations. We thought we had always been Northerners until I learned my great-great-grandfather and his brother were the only members of their prominent slaveholding family to enlist in the Union military during the Civil War. When they left the South for good, they left those family stories behind. This discovery links me to a meticulously documented lineage available on the WikiTree genealogy website, where I find histories including kings and queens and lords and ladies and founding fathers. Along with knowledge of these prominent historical figures comes a disturbing history of enslavement, settler colonialism and oppression that some of my ancestors were apparently eager to rebel against. What's my connection to this history? As an adoptee, I already have a troubled relationship to the very notion of genealogy, not belonging fully to either my adoptive or birth family histories. 
Indeed, I felt a sense of dislocation from family history since I was given a family tree assignment in elementary school. I remember feeling outed as an adoptee by the requirement to construct a genealogy and deeply disturbed by the irreconcilable dilemma I was caught within. I knew that the questions behind this assignment were about my biological ancestors, but as an adoptee with sealed birth records, I felt trapped by the logic of the family tree story. All I knew about my birth parents at that point was that they were unmarried teenagers. If I embraced the social narrative of genetics, my biology, my biology should tell the story of my identity, leaving me with absence, erasure, and sealed records. I could reconcile my parents, siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins as family because we loved each other. But as a kid, I struggled with how to justify claiming the ancestors of my adoptive family as my own. I didn't know them, so how could they be shaping who I am? I was surrounded by social narratives celebrating biology and genetics as real family connections. And what did that mean for me? The metaphor that moves me toward reconciling these tensions is that of a grafted tree. Once the young branch of an apple tree is grafted onto a peach tree, it's nurtured by the roots of the peach as it grows, the peach tree as it grows. Through this image, I can understand my life and identity as having been shaped and structured by both my birth and adoptive families. I don't carry the bloodline or genetic legacy of my adoptive family encoded in my body, yet their care, socialization, and stories have shaped the growth of my bones and substance of my flesh. I have some agency in this process when I move beyond rigid understandings of genetic heritability and focus on cultural socialization. I have a place to stand in these larger narratives about family, nation, and belonging. My identification leans toward the insider-outsider kin in this grafted tree. In the interstitial spaces between story white pedigrees, I find my multiracial ancestors. I call her Great Aunt Julia as a way of reclaiming her as kin. In resistance to the newly discovered horrors of enslavement, I find in my family tree. One of my newly discovered southern great-grandfathers seven generations back conveyed by deed of trust three enslaved girls, Sally and Charlotte, two Negro girls, and Julia, a mulatto girl, to his son-in-law for the use and benefit of his daughter on December 24th, 1813. Christmas gifts to his daughter, was Julia a mulatto girl, his daughter too? Did he send her away to remove the reminder for his wife that he increased their wealth by raping and impregnating enslaved women? Virginia law dictated that the race of the child followed the race of the mother. The children massa fathered with the women he enslaved were legally black and enslaved like their mothers. Who was Julia's mother? Under what circumstances did a white man impregnate this unnamed enslaved black woman? How did he justify his barbaric behavior? Did he tell himself she wanted it? Did he know her name? Or did he just think of her as Jezebel? As I discussed in the previous section, narratives of black women's supposedly deviant sexuality have been a consistent feature in public discussions of family throughout the history of the United States. The circumstances of oppression these stories justify and obscure have shifted over place and time. Yet such stories have remained an insidious light motif, articulating relationships between the state and mothers of color. The erasure of the lives of Julia, her mother, and all those she viewed as kin from legitimate genealogies of family and national history demonstrates that legitimacy, not biology, determines real kinship. These absences in my family tree show us the ways that white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism shape how events and the lives of the past become part of what we think of as history. Who was Julia's family? Her white father and sister would not have acknowledged this filial relationship. What happened to her after she was taken from the family she had known? One of the most devastating horrors of enslavement was the separation of families and the constant threat of loss. 
Historians of slavery emphasize a tradition of collective child rearing that developed among enslaved families as a survival strategy in a destructive social system in which they were legally defined as property rather than full human beings. Extra legal cultural practices such as jumping the broom, informal adoption, and a history of women mothering and caring for children to whom they had no biological connection provided avenues through which to perform family in meaningful and resistant ways that contributed to their physical, spiritual, and emotional survival under horrific circumstances of oppression. Kinship among enslaved people was not strictly experienced through biological heritability nor legal definitions of legitimate family. We recognize a history of other mothering among women of color, but why would we assume all of these women were heterosexual? Fictions of white heteronormativity typically foreclose considerations of ancestors as queer. We cannot impose contemporary categories of homosexuality onto people of the past, but neither can we assume that heterosexuality, as we currently understand it, was the exclusive norm. Domination wrote history, and struggles over whom and what were excluded continue to rewrite it. What if some of the other mothers who raised so many non-biological children were queer? Julia may have found comfort in the arms of another woman. We have no way of knowing the intimate details of her life. Julia is included in a grafted family tree, as are the power relations that exclude her from the legitimate lineage. My family tree exploration reveals the social reproduction of whiteness, blackness, gender, sexuality, queerness, and legitimacy. I didn't find great aunt Julia in the legitimate family tree. I found her in the Fairfax, Virginia property transfer records. She only becomes legible as family when I move beyond the template of family legitimacy I have to literally refocus my lens from birth certificates and census lists to property transfer records. She only becomes discernible as family when power relations quietly regulating the system are made visible. I reclaim her and the unnamed ancestors left out as a legitimate lineage to which I as a queer adoptee also do not fully belong. Allegories about family trees with images of roots and branches and apples not falling too far. Reinforce notions of family as natural and unchangeable over time and across cultures. We learn to see families through templates for legitimate citizenship balanced with exponential pairings of straight, same race, gender specific opposites. Unless you prune them to conform Trees don't actually have that rigid structure. Branches are tangled and unpredictable. Sprouts pop, leaves fall, roots are buried so deep, the foundation of the tree cannot be seen. We cannot call families or trees natural in any pure sense. Both are pruned and regulated by their interactions with the parts of the world in which their roots take hold. Not all land is hospitable to all kinds of trees. As Toni Morrison reminds us in The Bluest Eye, some soil is bad for certain kinds of flowers, certain seeds it will not nurture, certain fruit it will not bear. And when the land kills of its own volition, we acquiesce and say the victim had no right to live. Some trees thrive in federally protected forests while others are logged and plundered for their resources, context matters. The metaphor of a grafted tree is useful for thinking critically about the complexities of family and national belonging. This allegory about kinship implicates power. Whose hand splices the branches and ties them together? Whose social vision shapes the planting and care of the orchard? Who waters and cares for fragile young shoots? Trees and families grow and are sustained 
in relation to the nurture they receive, but they're also maintained by the power relations, shaping the care and resources provided. Who owns the land and how is it valued? Grafted trees are a useful allegory for thinking about the complex ways that nature, nurture, and power interact to shape social understandings of contemporary families. This template moves beyond either or questions about nature versus nurture, recognizing that biology, culture, and power interact in complex ways to shape all family trees. Thank you. I will now move on to questions. Uh, we have a question. Do you think that the Reagan administration's handling of the HIV AIDS crisis was part of the reason for the pushback against homosexual couples in the 1990s as contributing to the degradation of the family unit? Yes, I would say so. I would say absolutely. Uh, Ronald Reagan did some uh, some serious damage to views of queer people and single mothers. We have to remember as well that he is the person who really coined the term welfare queen and, and really started fostering that image, which is something that was used very explicitly in congressional dialogues about the passage of welfare reform. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, I am very pleased to move on to the announcement of the next Stallknocker Award. It's my honor to announce the Stallknocker Lecture Award for this year. This very productive scholar is a full professor at Drake whose research has contributed in important ways to her field as well as to our own campus. This scholar has published numerous articles and a book, yet she also generously applies her research skills to public knowledge as her nominator put it, Drake has benefited directly from her scholarship through the expertise she has developed about the campus's architectural history, focusing on the buildings and master plans developed from the 1940s through the 1960s, including the buildings by the famed architects Arrow and Eliel Serenin, Mies van der Rohe and Harry and Ben Weiss. This scholar organized and curated two separate exhibitions about Drake's architectural history. She also wrote two scholarly catalogs that will serve to preserve the history long after the buildings are gone. Much credit is owed to her regarding the attention Drake shows toward preserving its architectural history as it continues to remove, to renovate buildings and modify campus plans. As you may have guessed by now, the recipient of this year's Stallknocker Lecture Award is Professor of Art History, Maura Lyons, Please join me in congratulating her. I believe we will now be moving on <laughs> to another award. Volume. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, I'm now turning you all over to the Dean of the uh, Arts and Science Colleges, who will actually, I think what we're going to now is a video from Leah Kalmanson. This is so you all can just be eagerly anticipating. There we go.
And we do know that you can't hear. So hopefully, there we go, we're gonna fix that so that you all can hear Leah as well as see her. Good evening, everyone. I'm Leah Kalmanson from Philosophy and Religion. And tonight I'm here as the director of the Center for the Humanities. It is my honor to be able to announce the recipient of the Humanities Research Scholar Award for the 2021 cycle. This award provides research support through a combination of course releases and funding over a three year term to an associate or a full professor in the early stages of a major research or creative project in the humanities. Normally, I would tell you a little bit about the research first and maybe try to build some suspense before announcing the name, but given the nature of the research, I don't think suspense is possible. I think it will be easiest if I just start out by telling you that Sandy Patnamani is working on a new book. The new book grew out of the old. In Queering Family Trees, Sandy makes the following comment. Traditional family trees are envisioned as solitary, patriarchal structures, legitimating all in their branches. In contrast, grafted trees are intersectional, celebrating and nurturing connections. Her new book is titled Grafted Trees, Mixed Race Family Histories and National Belonging. It reflects her research through oral histories and archival work on three grafted family stories, um, one centered on a multiracial group of families in Connecticut, descended from the Nahantic tribe, now seeking to regain governmental recognition after the tribe was declared extinct in 1870. Another, the Fairfaxes of Virginia, a prominent colonial family whose members include the mixed race descendants of black ancestors in the Bahamas. And a third, the Goldberg family, Jewish immigrants who moved from Russia to New York to Omaha and finally Albuquerque, and whose path across the U.S. intersects with a timeline both before and after Jews were officially classified as white following World War II. Together, these histories address questions about how racial and ethnic identities are defined through cultural systems, social institutions, public policies, allowing Sandy to read them as a set of allegories about U.S. history, race, reproduction, and national belonging. I don't think Sandy needs any more of an introduction from me tonight. Our next recipient of the Humanities Research Scholar Award is Dr. Sandy Patnamani. Congratulations, Sandy. This concludes our 2020 Stall Nucker Lecture. Thank you, Sandy, for this great presentation that makes us think of family trees in new ways and in more inclusive ways. Congratulations to the 2021 Stallnecker Lecturer, Maura Lyons. We look forward to her presentation about a year from now, hopefully back in the beautiful Sheslow Auditorium. Uh, and then also congratulations to the Humanities Research Scholar this year, again, Professor Sandra Patton Imani. What a night. Thank you all for joining us tonight for this first ever live streamed Stallnecker lecture, celebrating the intellectual vibrancy of our community here in the College of Arts and Sciences at Drake. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. <laughs>